Hi, this is Adam Law. Today's video, we're going to speak about Yom Kippur. Everybody knows Yom Kippur as a holiday, which a lot of people actually uh, have dread thinking about. But is it really worth fearing? Or is there something deeper and more special about Yom Kippur? So what do we dread about Yom Kippur? Well, most of us are afraid of fasting for 25 hours, as well as there are actually in total five different prohibitions that we do on Yom Kippur. We don't eat and drink. We don't wash one's body. We don't anoint oneself, i.e. with oils or lotions. We don't wear leather shoes and we don't have marital relationships. In addition, Yom Kippur has all the laws of Shabbos on it, meaning is all the prohibitions of Shabbos, like driving, cooking, etc. Obviously, you're not gonna cook. As well as on Yom Kippur, we pray all day long. It is the only service of the year where we have five different prayer services, starting with Kol Nidre and Mariv, and then going through Shachris, Musaf, Mincha, and then the special prayer which we only have on Yom Kippur, Ni'ila, the closing of the gates, so to speak. Yom Kippur means the Day of Atonement, and that's exactly what it is. This process from Rosh Hashanah through Yom Kippur is a process where man reaches out to God, and spiritually reconnects himself to his source. Even though we associate this fear and awe and dread of Yom Kippur, there's actually something much more special and spiritual about Yom Kippur. And that's forgiveness and complete atonement before God. So it is actually a day of great joy and love because we are forgiven and reconnected to God at this process. On Rosh Hashanah, we know that God sits in the throne of judgment. But in Yom Kippur, it's completely turned over to love, to rachamim, to mercy. So what are the roots of this? What's going on with Yom Kippur that makes it about love and connection when normally we associate it with mostly fear and awe and dread? So where did Yom Kippur come from? In Parshas Pinchas, which is in the end of the Sefer Bemidbar, we see all the holidays and festivals are spoken about, starting with Shabbos and Rosh Chodesh, the beginning of the month, and then it goes through all the holidays in chronological order, from Passover through Shavuos, to Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, and Shemini Atzeres. It says, on the 10th day of the seventh month, there should be a holy convocation for you, and you shall afflict yourselves. You shall not do any work. You shall offer an elevation offering to God for a satisfying aroma, one young bull, one ram, seven male lambs in their first year. Unblemished they shall be for you. In their meal offering, fine flour mixed with oil, and then it goes on to talk about the other offerings of that day. So we see here, when it lists all the holidays, it says it's a day of affliction, and it's on the 10th day of the seventh month, which is the 10th of Tishrei. So we see here already with Yom Kippur, there's an element of affliction of difficulty, of fasting. The word is anisem, and the word we know means fast. The word for a fast in Hebrew is tainis. But is that it? Is that the whole root of the holiday? There's gotta be much more to that. There are roots, each one which is more oblique in the Torah, that we're gonna go back to explore. There's three other roots which I'm going to explore right now of where Yom Kippur comes from. The most obvious one, and the one which is going to lead quite a bit into our service itself, is the story of Nana of Nevi'u. It was the day of the consecration of the Mishkan, the first of Nisan in the second year after the Jews left Egypt. The first day of Passover, they went through the year, and then the eight days leading up to the consecration of the Mishkan, the tabernacle, the portable sanctuary that the Jews had in the desert, which was the forerunner for the Holy Temple, the base of Mikdash, there were eight days of consecrations. And on the last day, was the first of Nisan, Rosh Chodesh Nisan. But on that day, something very dark happened. Let's read about it. So it says in Parsha Shmini, it was on the eighth day, Moshe summoned Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. So here they did a number of services. They did a number of uh, offerings, the bulls, sheep, calf, etc. Finally, after these services, these offerings, which they brought, the glory of God went out and appeared to the whole people. So that was good. It means that God had his agreements. God appeared in the temple, and we know that God promises he will dwell amongst us in the Mishkan, the tabernacle, which is the forerunner for the temple. Then chapter 10 starts, a very dramatic part of the Torah. 
The sons of Aram, Nadav and Avihu, each took his fire pan. They put fire in them and placed incense upon it. And they brought before God an alien fire that he had not commanded them. A fire came forth from before God and consumed them, and they died before God. Moshe said to Aaron, Of this did God speak, saying, I will be sanctified through those that are nearest to me, and I will be honored before the entire people. And Aaron was silent. Moshe summoned Mishael and Elzaphon, the sons of Aaron's uncle Uziel, and said to them, Approach, carry your brothers out of the sanctuary to the outside of the camp. They approached and carried them by their tunics to the outside of the camp as Moshe had spoken. So clearly Nav and Evihu made a mistake. These guys were these young upstart Kohanim, the sons of Aaron and Cohen, and they had all the levels. They were so spiritual and they wanted to go connect to God. So they went inside the holiest place in the Mishkan, the Holy of Holies. And there they went and they brought a fire offering. Of incense, And we know throughout the Torah that the incense, the Ketoris offering, was the most spiritual offering. But it also has an incredible amount of danger. They brought in this offering, which it says here, a strange fire which God had not commanded. And they brought inside the Holy of Holies on this day, on their own, without consulting their rabbis, Moshe and Aaron, and without being ready. And they were burnt up. But yet we see some interesting things here. One is, they were brought out in their tunics. If they were brought up all burnt up, why were their bodies and tunics basically intact? Do you think that if they were burnt up, for sure their clothes would be burnt up? Second of all, Moshe immediately comforts Aaron here without thinking about it and says, I will be sanctified by those who are nearest to me and I will be honored throughout the entire people. Why is Moshe speaking such praise about Nadav and Avihu when clearly they did something which was worthy of death and punishment? Clearly, there was something good going on here. As a matter of fact, the Midrash goes on to say that Moshe envied this death. as a death called a spiritual kiss, where the fire went up in their noses and burned out their souls, but they died intact. They went out in this holy way. But yet, they clearly made a big mistake because there's many criticisms as, as well to them. Besides the obvious fact that they died, the Torah says about them that they did a, fire, a strange fire which was not commanded. We also know the Kohenim are warned about drinking wine, so the connection is that maybe they were drunk or really high when they went in. And there are other reasons as well given. They weren't married, they didn't have children, they didn't follow their, their leaders, Moshe and Aaron. So clearly they also messed up. So there's this dualism going on here. What exactly happened here? And why is this important for Yom Kippur? We'll find out right now. Besides Parshas Pinchas, which we enumerated already, where it speaks about the day being a fast day, and the offerings they brought on that day, there's a Parsha which deals completely with Yom Kippur. And that famous Parsha in the Torah is Achrei Mos, found in Vikra. It's the beginning of chapter 16. Achrei Mos means after the death. It's talking about the death of the two sons of Aaron, Nadav and Avihu. It says there, God spoke to Moshe after the death of Aaron's two sons when they approached before God and they died. And God said to Moshe, speak to Aaron your brother, he shall not come at all times into the sanctuary, within the curtain, in front of the cover that is upon the ark, that he should not die, for in a cloud will I appear upon the ark cover. With this Aaron shall come into the sanctuary, with a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for an elevation offering. He shall don a sacred linen, linen tunic, linen breeches shall be upon his flesh, he shall gird himself with a linen sash and cover his head with a linen turban. They are sacred vestments. He shall immerse himself in water and then don them. For the assembly of the children of Israel, he shall take two he goats for a sin offering and one ram for an elevation offering. Aaron shall bring near his own sin offering bull and provide atonement for himself and for his household. He shall take the two he goats and stand them before God at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Aaron shall place lots upon the two he goats, one lot for God and one for Azazel. Aaron should bring near the he-goat designated by Lot for God and make for a sin offering. And the he-goat designated by Lot for Azazel should be stood alive before God to provide atonement through it, to send it to Azazel to the wilderness. Aaron shall bring near his own sin offering bull and he shall provide atonement for himself and for his household and he shall slaughter his own sin offering bull. And then it goes on. It says, he shall take a shovel full of fiery coals from atop the altar that is before God. 
and his cupped hands full of finely ground incense, spi incense spices and bring it within the curtain. He shall, bring the in he shall place the incense upon the fire before God so the cloud of the incense shall blanket the ark cover that is upon the tablets of the testimony that he shall not die. He shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle with his forefinger upon the eastern front of the ark cover and in front of the ark cover he shall sprinkle seven times from the blood with his forefinger. He shall slaughter the sin offering he go to the people and do with his blood as he did with the blood of the bull and sprinkle it upon the ark cover and the front of the ark cover. Thus shall he provide atonement upon the sanctuary for the contaminations of the children of Israel, even for the rebellious sins among all their sins. And so he shall do for the tent of meeting that dwells with them amid their contamination. Any person shall not be in the tent of meeting when he comes to provide atonement in the sanctuary upon his departure. He shall provide atonement for himself, for his household, and for the entire congregation of Israel. He goes out to the altar, makes atonement on there with the blood of the bull and the he goat. And then he goes to the one he goat that's still alive. He leans his hands upon it and he confesses all the sins of the children of Israel, including the rebellious sins. And he places them upon the head of the he goat and sends it with an ish et, a designated man until the wilderness. It shall go and bear all the iniquities to an uninhabited land and he should send the he goat to the wilderness. He then goes on and removes the shovel and the ladle and completes the service. And then it goes on and says, regarding Yom Kippur, some more details. This shall remain to you an eternal decree. In the seventh month, on the tenth of the month, you shall afflict yourselves, and you shall not do any work, neither the native nor the proselyte who dwells among you. For this day... He will provide atonement for you to purify you. For all your sins before God, you'll be purified. It is a Sabbath of complete rest, and you shall afflict yourselves, an eternal decree. The Kohen, the anointing Kohen, i.e. the Kohen Gadol, is the one who does this. He places on the special vestments, and he brings atonement on the Holy of Holies, the tent of meeting, the altar, the Kohenim, and all the people of the congregation. It is an eternal decree to bring atonement for their sins one day of the year. So this, in basically, is the service of Yom Kippur. It's a special service where the Kohen Gadol brings all of these different special offerings, whether it's the incense, it's the two goats, one to Azazel and one for God. And he shall not do this at any time, it says. And notice it says here, after the death of Aaron's two sons. That's the name of the Parsha. And then it goes on and talks about what Yom Kippur is, it's a day of affliction. We know that also from Parshas Pinchas, which is later. And it's the, seventh, it's the seventh month, the tenth day of the month. And it brings atonement. It has a special ability to clean up, clean up everything. The base of Mikdash, the Kohenim, and all the individual people. It has a special power. And the Kohen Gadol is the special person to do this. But there's so many other questions again here. Why is this linked to the sons of Aaron? What's this business with the goat to Azazel? One to God and one to Azazel? How is that possible? We know that the whole service of God is not involve any other angels or beings or anything like that. Judaism is pure monotheism. How could it be here on the holiest day of the year that we seemingly bring an offering to Azazel, to something? What is Azazel? Anyway, this is where we bring this goat to this place called Azazel, to the wilderness and all their sins go upon it. There's a lot of questions here, and we're gonna get back to that. So now I'd like to get to the third of the four different sources in the Torah, and again, we're getting more obscure, because unlike the first one in Parshas Pinchas, and the second one with the death of Nadav and Avihu in Parshas Shemini and Parshas Achrei Mos, now we're getting to our third source. And the third source goes even deeper. We know that man fell at the beginning. Adam and Eve, Chava, made a mistake. They ate from the fruit of the tree of knowledge. This caused them to fall mightily and they became mortal. They were almost like immortal beings in this super spiritual state, but yet they became impure. At the receiving of the Torah, the Jewish people were risen up again to the level that they were before the sin of Adam. And they were ready to march into the land of Israel 
and it would be a world of Mashiach, Messiah, of the Gan Eden, of the Garden of Eden. It would have been a wonderful time where all Jews and the whole world were so connected to God. But we know that something else happened. Forty days after the Jewish people received the Torah, they weren't patient, and they committed the sin of the golden calf, which was a grievous sin. And God seemingly wanted to wipe them out. And we know there was a number of periods of time, 40-day periods, where Moshe went up to the mountain and pleaded before God to forgive them for this sin. It was like they were married to God at Sinai, and yet 40 days later, they were already straying after this other God, this golden calf, maybe the most grievous sin ever to be committed. And it was parallel to what happened to Adam. Just as Adam had fallen down and Eve had fallen down and became more human and more mortal, so to the Jews lost the special crowns which they received at Sinai and succumbed to the sin of the golden calf. And they went back down again. Moshe stood up though. And for periods of 40 days, he went and prayed before God and he argued, please let these people live, let them survive. And he took total self-sacrifice. He said, erase me from this book of the Torah. I don't want to be in part of this if you're not going to save the people. And what was the day that they were forgiven? The day was Yom Kippur, the 10th of Tishrei. And that day became the day which was set as the day of atonement of Kapara. And then after that, we got to the whole story of Nadav and Vihu and the consecration of Mishkan, which happened basically about a little less than six months later in Nisan. After that, we got to the Parshas and Achrimos, where God says, don't do it like the sons of Aaron. This is how you do it. You can't enter into the holy at all times. This is how you do it. Yes, Nadav and Avihu, to answer our question about their motives, had very pure motives. They wanted to be connected to God. They wanted the love and the connection, the spirituality. But yet, there's an element of fear and dread in the service of God as well. And that's what we feel every Yom Kippur. And so that's why in Akre Mos, God says, don't go into there at all times. What you did was right. As a matter of fact, the very mistake that they made by bringing the incense into the Holy of Holies became the basis of the service which we do every year on, on, on Yom Kippur, which the Kohen Gadol would do. Now we only read it because we don't have the temple and we don't have the Kohen Gadol. We act in this place by reading it on Yom Kippur afternoon. But the very mistake they did had the right intentions. It's like not a Vihu took one for the team. They taught us how serious the Mishkan was. They wanted to connect to God. And that answers why Moshe said to Aaron, I'm envious. These guys are the holiest. They died to teach us how important the temple is and how important the service of God is. They did the right thing by the right intention. They had all the good intentions, but yet they did it the wrong way. They weren't told to do this. They brought in a strange fire. But yet we're going to take that service and we're going to make that the very height of the service of Yom Kippur. Because what they did had a good aspect to it. They were trying to reach out to the infinite. And Yom Kippur is a day where we have incredible potential to reach out to the infinite. As I said, each of the sources get more and more oblique, meaning they're less direct. You will not find this explicitly in the Torah, but you will see it in the Tehillim. At the very beginning of Breshis Rabbah, it speaks about the creation of the world because we're talking about Breshis. And there it speaks about seven things which were in God's mind to create or were actually created before the world was created. And it gives six different ones, things like the throne of glory, the name of Messiah, uh, the Torah. These were all spiritual things that were created before the world was created. But yet there's a seventh. It says, Rabbi Ava Barebi Ze'era, Amar, Af Hatshuva, also before the world was created, Teshuva, repentance was created. And his proof is Tehillim. In Psalms it says, Tzadi, before the world was birthed, at that moment, a person returned to nothingness or simplicity or broken downness. Meaning the concept of a person being broken down to nothingness, which is tshuva, was before the world was created, before the mountains were formed. Because we know if there wasn't a concept of tshuva, there would be no ability for this world to last. And we see that by our source of the golden calf. The people really maybe did deserve to be wiped out. As a matter of fact, the Gemara in Shabbos says 
the concept of tshuva is so important that we see the sins of David Melech and the golden calf, of what extreme levels tshuva is possible to fix from. So we know that we can always return to God. And maybe that is the secret of the 13 attributes of mercy, which were gifted to Moshe for Yom Kippur, and which we recite many, many times before and on Yom Kippur, and some even recite it every single day. The idea that God is merciful, that must be built into creation. The creation itself had an element of physicality and judgment, as we spoke about in Rosh Hashanah. Yom Kippur is a day of love and teshuva and return and kapara and connection. And that's why in that day, it says in the Mishnah, that even shaduchim were made. Men and women would wear white and go out into the fields and they would meet each other because it's a day of love. What greater day of forgiveness, of connection between us and God? As we see, we were forgiven on that day after the golden calf on Yom Kippur. But it was set from the beginning of creation. And then it became set on that day, but also through the mistakes. Because even though the mistakes of, of Nadav and Avihu were severe enough for them to be wiped out, they were tzadikim, that they meant good. They wanted to connect to God. Their love was good. But we found out in Akramos that you must do it only under these prescribed conditions. The Kohen Gadol, one day of year, and he has to go through this whole process. So now let's speak about the service of Yom Kippur. In our day and age, we only read about the Yom Kippur service as the height of the prayer service, which we read in the afternoon around the Musaf during the repetition of the Chazan. We read about what the Kohen Gadol would do, the whole voda of the day. You have to understand that we are living in exile and that there was a great time when we had a temple. The Judaism of the temple, as you see clearly in the Torah and in the Talmud and other sources, was very centered around the temple service. People would come three times a year for the Regalim or other times and they would see the tremendous pageantry and spirituality of the temple service, of the Kohenim, a special tribe within the Jewish people, who would bring sacrifices and there'd be beautiful music playing of the Levites playing at the same time. And you would smell the smell of incense wafting and the delicious smell of the burning meat on the sacrifices. And people from all over the world would come. And it was a tremendously beautiful building. Where the Kotel is, the Wailing Wall now, was actually one of the foundation walls for the second temple period, Beis HaMikdash, the temple. And it was the most beautiful building you could possibly imagine. After the Mishkan in the desert, we actually had two temples, King Solomon's temple, as well as the temple of the second temple period. It was an incredibly beautiful building of white Jerusalem stone, one of the most beautiful places in the world. And in that holiest day, Yom Kippur, the Kohen Gadol, would do a special service. We spoke about the basis of this service already in this video, Yenadav Avihu, and how what they did, the incense service, became the height of the day. But we also read the whole Parsha, and we spoke about a number of sacrifices that the Kohen Gadol would make for the whole people, to give them kapara, atonement, that on one day we become so clean, so pure, and it was brought about by the special man called the Kohen Gadol, and the service that he would do. And yet we also see a strangely, seemingly demonic element, where one goat goes to God, but the other goat sacrificed goes away to Azazel. And what is Azazel? We know from tradition it would be a rocky cliff where the special designated man would push the goat off the cliff with a red string tied around it and it would go tumbling down the cliff and be ripped apart. And at that place, they would go back and they would find the dead goat and if the sins were forgiven, the red string tied around him would have been turned to white. It's a strange thing. How could it be one goat goes to God and one goat goes to Azazel? What a strange concept. Not, doesn't seem very Jewish. How did this make it in here? I'm the holiest of holy days. So a lot of my work in this section is going to be based on the Rebbe's of the Ishbitz Ridzin dynasty and their Torahs. Also other holy Svarim that talk about the spiritual meanings of these services. But I want to give my thanks to uh, Rabbi Betzel Naor in his book from a Kabbalist diary. He has an essay called Ascent and Descent in the Yom Kippur Rite based on the Rebbe's of Ishbitz Ridzin. And here he kind of talks about, he brings together many different Torahs to speak about what exactly is going on here. Reb Noor points out here, there's classical motives here going on on this most important day. We know that Yom Kippur, again, with Mo Moshe 
ascend to the highest of heights. And that is also the symbol of the Kohen Gadol, the most holy man going into the highest of heights, going into the holy place, the holy of holies, and bringing the incense, the cloud offering. And the cloud represents the mystery, the mystery of God. As well, on the same day, we pass over this goat with our sins on it and push it off to Azazel, to almost the realm of the demonic. We see this pageantry of the spiritual height of the Kohen Gadol versus the darkness, the depth of the man, the designated man. And there's actually a tradition that was to go on that Ishiti, the designated person who would bring the goat to Azazel, would actually die after that. Just such extreme juxtapositions of these classical motives between the height of the height and the low of the low. At the height of the height of the day, the Kohen Gadol, in his pure white robes, walks into the Holy of Holies. There he carries the incense offering, and he burns incense before God, entering the most holy place where no man may enter. As a matter of fact, it says in the Torah, no man may be with him when he enters the holy. It says, he may not have any preparation before he goes in. What does this mean? He's going to this highest, holiest place. What happens inside there? We know this is linked to the Machlokas and the Gemara between the Tzedokim and the rabbinic tradition. Their position, the Tzedokim, the Sadducees, is that they would light the smoke before. One verse says, for in a cloud I shall appear on the ark cloud. And the other one says, he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord. So one seemingly senses that before he goes in, before the, the ark cover, he goes in, he has to uh, prepare the smoke. And that's what the Sadducees held. The rabbinic tradition, our tradition, held that he wouldn't light the smoke before he goes in. That he should not prepare before he goes in. What does it mean he should not prepare? The place he's going to is like a place of complete oneness, of complete love and fear and connection to God. We ourselves go to that place on, on Yom Kippur, the Ni'ila prayer, the Holy of Holies, when we go inside the deepest, the highest, the most one state with God. And then when he comes out, we see there in the liturgy that he makes a prayer. The question is, why does he not make a prayer when he's inside the Holy of Holies? If you're gonna be that close to God, why not make a prayer? Well, we see already in the story of Moshe, when he was in the highest of highs, it says in the Talmud, when he was there, where he's praying with such closest to God that the Jewish people should be forgiven. And there he says, God, show me your glory. And there God says, you mean, no one may know my glory. God's ways are unknowable. There God says, I will be merciful upon I will be merciful. I will be graceful to those I will be graceful to. When Moshe asks God at that highest moment before Yom Kippur, he's at the top of the mountain, he prays to God and says, God, show me the secret of your glory. The Gemara says he means, show me the secret of suffering, of why people are suffering. That's the big mystery. Why do righteous people suffer? What's the purpose of suffering? And God says, I will be merciful upon I will be merciful, and I will give grace to who I will give grace. Meaning is, it's up to God. I will not answer this. I cannot tell you the secret. This is the secret of all existence. It's the final level, which even Moshe didn't see the deepest reality of why people suffer. And it's a place of just oneness, that it just is. God is one. God's way is the way. And that's the Kohen Gadol, the mind state that he gets to when he gets in. That's what it means he shall not prepare. And that's why he lights the smoke inside, the incense smoke inside the Holy of Holies. Because inside that place of the Holy of Holies, he should not prepare. Because he's going to be so completely unified with God that he can't possibly prepare. And then when he comes out, he prays. Because when you're in that state of oneness, there's no possible way you can pray. You just accept everything. You have this epiphany moment where you realize it's all God, it's all one, it's all good. And it's just oneness and spiritual light. That's the moment of enlightenment. When he comes out and his level lowers, then he can make a prayer. Because you don't need to pray when you're at that moment. There's actually a story, with a few different Rebbe's have this story, but the Ishbitzer Rebbe as well, where someone asked him to go up high with a meditation and asked the Ishbitzer Rebbe, go up and pray to God, please, to stop these evil decrees that are happening to the Jews of Europe. And when he came back, they saw that nothing had changed. And they asked him, Rebbe, what did you do when you were up there? He said, when I got to the highest of heights, I realized everything is exactly the way it's supposed to be. And that's the secret of heaven of accepting and seeing everything's exactly the way it's supposed to be. When we get to the next world, we're gonna realize that, that everything was exactly the way it was supposed to be. And that's why it says in the Torah, 
There should be no man when he enters the holy because it's a truly angelic state beyond man and his weaknesses, his need to pray, etc. At that state, he's just one. He's an angel. He's just like completely connected. And the exact opposite, simultaneously, we see the descent to the demonic. A man is sent out to bring this goat to be brought to the wilderness. What's going on here? It's like this demonic thing. Is it true that there's God and there's also demons and evil and Satan? No! We realize that everything serves God. It's all part of God's purpose in the world. We don't believe in God versus Satan. Satan is a servant of God. And we know the demonic here actually does refer to the forces of the, of the desert, of the wilderness, of the harshness, of the darkness, of the satanic demonic forces. Those forces on Yom Kippur want to makatrig us, want to say, look at these Jews wearing white, praying on Yom Kippur. How dare they stand before you, God? And, and Satan has a point. He has a point. How dare we stand before God, sullied in our garments as we are, so to speak. So that's why we send this quote-unquote bribe. It's not a service to Satan. It's not a sacrifice to a demon. This goat to Azazel, it's a bribe. That Satan is right. We don't really deserve this. Just like God had said, maybe we, the Jews do deserve to die after the golden calf. Nevertheless, mercy is there. And we appease this darkness in a way. It's, it says in the Holy Farm, throw the dog a bone and he'll wag his tail. That we acknowledge that in this existence, this fallen existence, you have a realm, you have a role to play in this world. And there must be judgment and harshness and darkness in the world in order to give free will. And therefore there must be the possibility of evil in the world. But on this day, it's our only day to get back to that level of tshuva that was created before all creation. And therefore, this day we must keep the Satan quiet. And so this go to Azazel, according to the Holy Farm, according to the Kabbalistic Farm, is a bribe, so to speak. It's a bribe to keep him quiet and make him happy. And maybe even in the end, he'll end up praising us and see these Jews, they're not so bad after all. They give out me his due. We're not serving, we're not praying, God forbid, to some other power. We're just merely appeasing a power, a heavenly power, which role is to make judgment in the world because it's a necessary part of the world existing. And that's why we send the goat to the Azazel. It's for our benefit. There's only one God, but God does create forces in the world which have darkness. And in this day, the day where we would get close to God, that force must be bribed. What's more is we can even acclimate these dark powers. The third Rebbe, the Ritzina Rebbe, the Sojusharim reads that we can even utilize this darkness. According to Hasidic tradition, it's something to be brought inside of us. We use our powers to bring God up in this world. We're not ascetics. We're not trying to leave this world. We use the darkness of this world, the judgments, the physicality, the materialism of this world for good. So too, we turn this power, the power of the darkness, into our servant on this day. That everything is rectified and shuva is possible no matter where we fell. The Sodya Sharm reads, The goat to Azazel was sent to the desert. Through this sacrifice, the power of the desert, the harsh forces, will be rectified. People recognize in civilization God's greatness and they bless him and his honor is, mon and his honor is magnified. But he also creates the dark forces, the forces of the desert, the world of destruction. There, in those dark places, the honor of heaven is not visible. There are great powers which are undisciplined and do not approach the human form. With so too within our soul are all the powers, wild, impulsive, destructive powers, which we cannot fathom the use and the benefit for how these are important for the glory of heaven. They are the worlds of destruction. They are very great. Evil, lust, and anger come from them, which obscures the light of God. However, on this day of tshuva, when a man returns, he can observe his soul as being exalted from God. When he pushes aside all his desires of food and all the other things that we do on this day. And we pray and we become like angels. We harness those wild powers. The Yetzirah, the evil destructive force, is nullified. And then we can bring those powers into vigor and strength for the service of God. And you will see how, God forbid, you would think that these powers are separate from God. It's not God against Satan. 
God rules even over these powers. Therefore, you will perfect even the powers of the desert. That is the secret of the God to Azazel. In this unrectified world, we must understand that good and evil are necessary and that both are brought into the service of God and the oneness of God on this day of Yom Kippur. That is the demonic realm, which happens simultaneously with the realm of the holy, of the Kohen Gadol's service. And all is rectified, and we're all one, and we're all pure, and we're all connected to the spiritual highest of heights on Yom Kippur. When we, imp when we implement all sides and everything is fixed from not of Avihu's sin, we see the greatest service from the greatest man on the greatest day in the greatest place happens, the incense offering. But we must recognize those darker forces, those forces which are necessary. There must be forces of punishment in this world in order for the world to be returned to the oneness of God. On Yom Kippur, we become the Kohen Gadol, and we unify all our forces to get a complete atonement as God had set up from the very beginning of the world, the power of Teshuva. We bring that in on this special day set aside by Moshe to be on this day. And we see from Navin of you and the different partials in the Torah that no matter where a person is, even if they did the golden calf, the worst of the worst, they can return to God. So too we let everyone in the shul on Yom Kippur, that everyone should return and connect and to become one and, and, and atoned for on Yom Kippur, where we act as the Kohen Gadol, spiritual representation before God. It should be an amazing Yom Kippur this year. Everyone should have a blessed year and a good Yom Kippur. Thank you very much. This is Adam Law with Wanderings with Adam Law. Have a good holiday.